we have the great pleasure of being able to uh, welcome a series of international guests uh, to Frankfurt to discuss the films of Satyajit Ray with us. Uh, today we have Ravi Vasudevan, uh, who will be talking about Abhijan. Uh, just to give a brief introduction to Ravi's illustrious career, he is a director of Sarai, the Media Studies Research Program uh, at the, uh, for the study of developing societies uh, in Delhi, a center he founded with uh, Ravi uh, Sundaram. Uh, so the two Ravis are collaborating uh, together. He also co-founded the journal Bioscope, South Asian Screen Studies, and is the coordinator of the media module uh, uh, at the International Center for Advanced uh, studies. A uh, little bit of background on Ravi. He studied modern history at uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi, one of the real um, major universities uh, in India, uh, before moving to study film studies uh, in East Anglia, of all places, uh, in particular under the auspices of Thomas Elsesser. I believe he was the second PhD student uh, to uh, uh, be uh, tutored by Elsesser. Uh, before returning to teach uh, at uh, JNU as well as uh, uh, other universities in India. Uh, his many publications include Making Meaning in Indian Cinema, an edited, edited, collection, from, edited collection sorry, from the year 2000, uh, Cities of Everyday Life from 2002, Media Crisis from 2003, uh, and most recently, uh, well, not most recently, but uh, kind of probably most prominently, The Melodramatic Public Film Form and Spectatorship from 2010. Uh, his current research concerns uh, non-fiction film infrastructures, film archives and historiography, uh, the history of publicity, which he may well uh, be working on uh, right now and, and possibly bringing to Frankfurt uh, in the near-term future, uh, as well as post-cinema media artifacts and political uh, imaginaries. Uh, he's actually in uh, Germany for a little while at the moment, uh, conducting research, uh, and indeed he gave a scintillating lecture uh, last semester on necropolitics and the ascendancy of Narendra Modi uh, in, in India. Um, but uh, today he'll be shifting the focus somewhat uh, to, to, let's say, a uh, more pleasant terrain uh, away from Narendra Modi's uh, political rise and towards uh, Satyajit Ray's cinema and in particular uh, Abhijan, the Expedition uh, Ray's movie from 1962, uh, Ray's road movie indeed from 1962. So please join me in welcoming uh, Ravi Vasudevan. Uh, that, uh, thank you, Danny, and thank you, uh, Vincent, for inviting me into this uh, very exciting uh, prospect of a curation of Ray's work. Uh, and I know that there's uh, quite a reasonable amount of work in just setting up a kind of background for many of you who may not be uh, as uh, very well aware of the, of the backgrounds and circumstances of uh, uh, his filmmaking, and especially specific contexts, specifically of Bengal, uh, the kind of regional culture he comes from in India, uh, and more generally, of course, uh, the relationship between Bengal and other kind of entities, regions, and uh, networks in India. Some of this comes up in Abhijan. Uh, when I was invited to uh, make a presentation in this series, uh, my uh, instinct was to uh, move away from the canoni canonical works uh, on the assumption that these are f fairly well known and there would be others, of course, uh, weighing in on those. And I thought it would be interesting to do what is uh, a very definitely a non-canonical work. Huh? This is important to, to register. Uh, because I don't want to uh, build your expectations necessarily in terms of the kind of uh, poetic qualities which we otherwise associate with Ray. I would argue there are elements of that in this film. Uh, but for various reasons, uh, it is perhaps not, doesn't have the certain type of integrity and flow which we sometimes as uh, associate with Ray's work, uh, which you would have, those of you, of you who are here for the last lecture would be familiar from uh, Pater Panchali. That would be already a sig signal for the types of the, the flow, the way in which the natural world and human existence come together. This is very much a film about disjunction. And that is what is, in a sense, interesting. It is predicated not on flow, but on intermittence, on things not actually kind of gelling together very well, on characters who are kind of inchoate 
uh, who are oh, neurotic, perhaps, uh, and who are, are violent uh, in terms of their instinctual kind of register. This was a kind of challenge which Ray was interested to take up in, take up, and which his lead actor, the figure whom you have not yet seen as a grown man, if you haven't, have you, if you've only seen Pater Panchali, would uh, uh, embody the later existence of Appu. Uh, and uh, and many many other roles uh, which uh, he wor we worked with Ray on, uh, right through to the end of Ray's career in the early 1990s. So these are kind of matching kind of biographies, if you want. And this is a particular moment, uh, which in fact uh, people who are great chroniclers of Ray do not rate. Huh? Uh, someone like Chidunandu Das Gupta, who was Ray's collaborator. They set up the Calcutta Film Society together in 1947. Uh, he said, this is not a work which gels. Uh, he, it doesn't have the characteristic capacity for depth of analysis of character, of analysis of situation, huh? that which we have come to be accustomed with uh, through the trilogy and other films such as Jal Shogur, which you will again see, The Music Room, which you will see later in this series. So that is a warning. <laughs> I just want to kind of set up, uh, don't kind of uh, uh, have a Ray film exactly in mind. But two things, cautions, apart from that. Ray, Ray's first idea for a film was not Pater Panchali. It was The Prisoner of Zenda. Huh? So ruritarian, a ruritarian romance and action huh? and the, all the skullduggery of mistaken identities. And this is something which was very extraordinarily popular in Bengal, huh? has gone through many iterations and film versions. But the master first thought he would do that. Huh? And then after perhaps visits to London and having been exposed a lot, uh, firstly to, through Lindsay Anderson, uh, to uh, the wealth of stuff which was coming out from Italy, that certainly was uh, a new kind of focus. But he was already aware of it. He read up everything he could about uh, foreign cinema. It wasn't easily available in India, but he certainly was aware of all of that. And he had, as you know, he had a kind of assistance with, assistantship with Jean Renoir when he came to uh, make The River in 1951. So it, it's not as if this guy was in, the, in a budding world cinephile. It was not as if, but he still, was kind of motivated by these other generic kind of uh, interests, you know, popular genre form. The elements of that in Abidjan as well. So just to keep you uh, uh, that in, in mind. Uh, there's an apocryphal story. Uh, Indians nowadays uh, 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 feel it would be very nice for everyone to know how important India has been in world culture and that uh, we, we have created so many things which people did not even know about. The, one of the claims is that Martin Scorsese, in making Taxi Driver, was influenced by Abhijan. Now, this is an interesting proposition, because when I mentioned that I was coming to give a talk on Abhijan, did you know that Martin Scorsese was actually influenced by Abhijan? I said I did not. But now, now that I reflect, why should it not be possible? Here you have uh, someone who is not a psychotic, but he's bordering on psychosis as the main protagonist. He rides a, drives a taxi. He is fixated on this virtuous uh, woman, huh? uh, who he would, you know, he's in the falling in love with her. Uh, it doesn't work. He comes across this prostitute who has to be saved, and he does so. Yes, there are certain kind of currents in Abhijan which actually parallel this. <laughs> then I looked very carefully for the thing. Uh, look for Scorsese. Yes, a great admirer, especially of Pater Panchali, but there's no word about Abhijan when Martin talks about Scorsese, as a, about, about Ray. So this is but just to flag uh, a kind of growing kind of way things parallel each other, you know, in the, in the world of cinephilia. And of course, apart from Indian hubris at wanting to have a certain type of, uh, you know, a privileged uh, situation in the world, which has become increasingly obvious in the recent past. Anyway, uh, so let us get down to this film in particular. Tara Shankar Bandopadhyay uh, is a great literary figure uh, uh, who actually straddled the 1920s to the 1970s. He was one of the uh, key figures in the development of a left-wing uh, 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 writing culture associated with the communist parties and his uh, f uh, short story, Jal Shagar, The Music Room, will be in this series. It's an adaptation done by Ray. This is another film 
uh, book uh, written by Tara Shankar, and it's actually teeming with life in an interesting fashion. I have used the word road movie uh, more as a provocation than anything else, huh? because you don't usually associate someone like Ray with a kind of road movie effect. Uh, but here I will try and make a bit uh, to actually kind of uh, explain why, why this might work in some interesting way. I've already, I've, this first set of points is really what I've already told you. Ray, in fact, was meant to write the uh, scenario for this film for a friend. Uh, but in fact, in the process, various things seduced him into actually kind of doing more. Uh, and he became excited, partially as I'll come to, with the uh, setup, the scene, uh, sorry, the landscape huh, within which this plot was uh, unraveling. It takes place at the border of two Eastern Indian states, uh, Bengal, which is where Ray comes from, and Bihar. Huh? And it's about, uh, it's a, a, a setup where it's a circulation uh, of uh, tr trucks, uh, taxis, uh, buses, uh, which are actually moving across space, transporting people from one and material from one location to the other. So it's really a, a place which is not a settled environment. And that is actually one of the interesting dimensions of it. It itself as a, is a space which is defined by a certain work in progress. Things are in under construction, as it were, in this space which he looks at. Ray became interested in this for another reason, because of a certain type of um, uh, the landscape which uh, had a set of um, remarkable uh, uh, rock formations. There's a third reason Ray became interested. Shantini Keton uh, is the place which Rabindranath Tagore, uh, the uh, uh, legendary poet and philosopher of uh, Bengal, uh, had set up as a place where there would be a replenishment of arts and crafts, but an open conversation with the new canons, not only of Western modernity, but of Eastern modernity. And there would be a kind of regular traffic of artists and intellectuals, for example, from Japan, who would come into this space. So Shanti Ketan had this reverberance. It had this kind of thing where this imprint to actually replenish a culture, uh, push colonialism back, but open up your conversations became very important. Ray was a student of Shantini Ketan. Just 12 miles away from Shantini Ketan happened to be the location where this film was, uh, being, was made and where also this unusual kind of rock formations, which aesthetically came to, uh, to in, engage him, were also part of the design. Now, um, these notes you can mostly ignore as I'm moving through because I'm telling you stuff in advance. Uh, but uh, this basically kind of uh, gives you a sense of the, the way in which he was coming into this, into this project. Uh, now, let, a very quick summary. Uh, there's uh, a figure uh, who is a quote unquote a Rajput. Now, a Rajput uh, would be the upper echelons of the Indian caste hierarchy. Uh, he would be a figure of the warrior caste, uh, a figure of kind of gallant of adventure, gallantry, uh, uh, great skills in military. This is the stereotype the, uh, of what a Rajput is. Uh, and the figure who is the hero, uh, played by uh, the great Shomitro Chatterjee, uh, is a taxi driver who is constitutively unstable. There's something not quite in kilter about this person. Uh, he loses temper rapidly. Uh, he rashly drives along these kind of absolutely rocky and uh, uh, country roads. Uh, he takes up challenges. Uh, but unfortunately, he's, he, doesn't, he's not, he has no savvy. He doesn't know who he's taking on. And the, the, uh, the actual infrastructures of administrative control is something he unwittingly kind of takes on when he overtakes an administrative officer's car and actually loses his license. This is his general thing, and he distrusts people. He's almost misanthropic in his uh, disposition. Part of the reason is his wife left him. And uh, the opening shot, which I'm not going to show you here because it is one of the most startling shots in the film, is, uh, uh, showcases a man in this kind of uh, way he's kind of making fun of uh, Ranveer Singh, making fun of the fact that he's lost his wife, encouraging him to kind of recover his courage as a Rajput to kind of come through in the world. And he's uh, and but uh, this and said, why don't you come into a car company, uh, uh, a dealer, a dealership with me? We'll work together. Your taxi, my taxi, etc. He said, no, I don't trust anyone. 
that's a kind of little uh, frisson of something really interesting. Please look at that opening shot. It's really fascinating. It's a one shot, but featuring two characters and a mirror. And it's uh, something I don't want to foreshadow too much because it's, it will take your, away your pleasure of looking at it. Um, this inchoate character, this figure who has now lost his license, he comes under the spell of this, of, of this manipulative, malevolent merchant huh? uh, called Sukhanram, who's a Marwadi. This is the other face of Rajasthan. Huh? There's an entire network of Marwadi, Rajasthani traders who are known for their uh, business acumen, but also for their underhand dealings. You know? They're also part and parcel of what Bengal is about. Sukhanram cajoles this chap, says, look, you can make more of your life. You've got this taxi. You can do a few little deliveries for me. Uh, and we come to know slowly that Sukhanram is actually thick in the opium trade and in se sexual, sexual trafficking. Huh? Uh, but willy-nilly, this chap comes under his spell. He wants to do better. Uh, so uh, one, there are these several forces which are uh, aligned with uh, Singh, uh, Singh Ji's, uh, he's just called Singh Ji, although his name is Ranveer Singh, he's just called Singh Ji. Um, he's one, the Marwadi uh, merchant, the malevolent merchant. Uh, then, unexpectedly, and this is a kind of first time, so it should be marked, uh, there's a person called Joseph Ranjan Das. Joseph Ranjan Das is a former untouchable converted to Christianity who Ranveer's family as Rajputs didn't have much to do with. This is the first time that Ray addresses the issue of caste and untouchability in his cinema. It's many, many years later. He takes up poverty, as you know, very uh, kind of substantially and intricately and imaginatively, but not necessarily caste and the hierarchies of caste, which are quite critical to the architecture of power in India. So this is an ex-untouchable family who were actually neighbors of Ranveer Singh's family. And they come together in this space. Uh, and there's a romantic di uh, dimension because Ranveer has a sister whom, uh, 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 Ranveer, uh, sorry, uh, Joseph has a sister who Ranveer is taken up with. A third figure is Gulabi. She is one of uh, the sexual kind of uh, traffic, uh, the sexual traffic of uh, Sukhanram. And finally, I would say the third, fourth allegiance is this battered Chrysler, uh, 30 years old, which uh, Ranveer keeps on repairing. So there's a fourth entity, if you want, who uh, lays claim to his allegiance and his affections, you know, in this kind of set of con con uh, contrasting and countervailing uh, uh, claims on his attention. And uh, that finally, well, I think wins through, which is interesting, but uh, along with others. Okay, why is this a road movie? Uh, so you'll see, and you'll uh, d disagree or agree that it is one as you watch the film. Uh, at one level, uh, the a scholarship on uh, Euro-American road uh, uh, films have argued that it's really about self-discovery. Now, the contours of self-discovery uh, are to do with the car. The car is a crucial vehicle, and it's also a vehicle of individuation, perhaps of bonding. No? But that would be the limit. You may have sometimes a group, but more, more likely than not, it's the individual and the... Or, or two buddies or two women, as we know later with Thelma and Louise. Huh? So that would be a characteristic uh, configuration. And you discover yourself, the world, politics, various kinds of things. And we have it with Wim Wenders, Kings of the Road, various things, you know, we'll be kind of mapping this kind of dynamic, how to explore the world through the car and through uh, uh, the, road, the road. Now, I just want to suggest two things about Ray. Firstly, there's an intimation right up with the uh, uh, title of his first film, which is Song of the Road. So it's just something to keep in mind as you're moving through uh, this kind of body or this corpus of work, what this could possibly mean. It's not the road movie as we know it, but nevertheless an intimation of unsettlement and the likelihood of displacement and the likelihood of a restless existence. Huh? Restlessness becomes a kind of governing trope. And that I think is part of the road movie design as well, but it's also part if you want, of the destiny, the Bildungsroman of Apu as he moves through uh, the, the trilogy and beyond. Uh, so restlessness uh, and this kind of unsettled condition, these become important itself. There is in my, uh, uh, as you see the film, uh, my suggestion is that there is actually a different kind of frame 
a kind of uh, a world within which this kind of restlessness operates. This is to do not uh, with, at one level with ac an accession to the technologies and uh, individuation of modernity, huh? but really to do with a much more dispersed field of existence, which is also a field predicated not on modernity itself and the accessions individuality gives you, but a more dispersed uh, social form, but also a more dispersed uh, material form. It is to do with the actual kind of uh, in-betweenness of the world. And as I'll show a few uh, uh, stills, it is to do with things being in the process of manufacture, things not being quite complete, buildings which are about, about to take place, the materials being assembled and laid around and about you and being transported. So this is now a kind of intermediary space. You know, It is not the space, say, of Calcutta or the space of Patna or the space of the, of the big cities, but it is a crucial conduit for the movement of, of these materials into these spaces to compose these, uh, these mod, uh, modern urban forms. So it, you're capturing something which is about the road, the actual kind of uh, transmission belt, if you want. And that becomes, I think, quite suggestive as, as a distinctive form, form of the road movie. And th this is my argument. So uh, I, I would say that Rapu is also that. Just keep that in the background as kind of a, a horizon. Here, for example, are images. This would be this, within the space where the transport agencies, the, the taxis and the uh, buses are, you'd be having, say, uh, this, uh, so stones broken and waiting to, for transportation for construction. Uh, you'll have these uh, empty oil barrels, huh? which are continuously part of the mise-en-scene. Here's a particular instance of a thing between the car driver, that is Singji, and this fantastic character actor whom you will probably see from time to time during the course of this curation called Robi Ghosh, a fantastic <laughs> actor, huh? who is his cleaner. There's an, a, a, a figure who's always with him, cleaning the thing and setting up the, and settling the engine. Um, here, for example, this is uh, Singji's room given to him by the Sate, the merchant, and it is basically a dump where sacks, perhaps of, uh, of fertilizer, perhaps of cement, is he, ha he has to cohabit with these, you know? So this becomes a kind of texture the, of, 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 of life here. Uh, this figure who is the object of the sex traffic uh, comes into Singji's space, but you can see this, pl uh, this uh, pile-up of sacks in the background as part of the uh, design for a, li of a life in the making. Uh, there's half constructions, pillars which are not quite uh, cut through, uh, made into walls and full of sacks. So this becomes the, the texture of this kind of space. It is, this, uh, it is the space of material in process in being carried through these kind of vehicles, and that becomes part of the, uh, the way in which the road and its functions are actually traversed here. But these are, one is these movements of a particular sort, there are the, also the circuits, the clarity of circuits, is, which makes you wonder, is this a road movie? Because a road movie has to make it a certain openness of design is also part of the design. Huh? And here the circuits may compose trade networks, construction material networks, but also illicit networks, uh, which are the networks governed by the, uh, the merchant, who is actually moving opium, who is moving women, you know, that kind of stuff. So these circuits are kind of what constitute the logic of the movement of these, of this, uh, of these cars, of these uh, uh, trucks, etc. cetera. Um, you have, of course, customers of different sorts coming in. We don't know where they come from. We don't quite see where they go to. So there are these kind of lawyers uh, who are at first spurning a, a, a bus. They said they would prefer to get into a car with uh, Singji. But then they're shocked and terrified because Singji actually is always likely to kind of take off. He never ever can stand anyone kind of going in front of him. So here he's overtaking a bus. The driver, he has a kind of unpleasant relationship with. And due to some of these kind of uh, tendencies on the part of Singji, he unwittingly overtakes a subdivisional officer of the, of the regional administration, which is not a wise thing to do, Singji. And uh, so the administrator pulls him up. This is an image of the administrator with cigar and with this kind of look, strips him of his license. So you have the road, but you have determinate circuits within which the road is, formula, uh, is uh, organized for travel and for this kind of drive. And you have the jurisdictions, which also can control and contain your access to the road and to movement. Huh? 
So he has to shift divisions. He has to move spaces in order to kind of get out of this and retrieve his license. In the between, he is, there's the third circuit, the circuit of illicit allure, the possibility of making an extra buck. This circuit can only take place at night. It, and it is uh, overseen by this entity who is continuously cajoling him into the possibilities which are available to him, the wealth he can gain, the possibility of becoming legitimate and part of a transport company. And there's this kind of the figure who's continuously in his face uh, uh, urging him to be part of his illicit design. That is the road. And those are the determinant kind of authorities and circuits and material and other economic forms which actually define it, within which this, uh, this figure of the instincts and the impulses of anger and, uh, you know, kind of out of, uh, out of control behavior, he's actually continuously kind of moving and railing at these kind of spaces. He can't quite manage them. But this, there's this other layer, and there are several layers to think of, how this, this road and the entities which compose it are actually assembled. And one is the Bengali cultural imaginary and the figure of the Rajput in the Bengali cultural imaginary. This is something worth thinking through. It is well known within Indian cultural studies that uh, an, uh, uh, a, a Bengal cultural renaissance emerges in the 19th century, taking on board all the kind of great kind of findings of European civilization, interacting with British culture, modernity, but also developing a powerful critique of colonialism over time. But these are figures of the so-called enlightenment. They are intellectuals. They may be bureaucrats. They may be administrators or literary figures. They are not figures of action. And this is, in a peculiar sense, a cultural deficit. So insofar as there's this overinvestment in the life of the mind, there's this other space. You look to other dimensions of India as it is kind of recovering its uh, creativity, and you look to Rajasthan. You look to Rajputana, you look to the figure of the kind of intrepid Rajput warrior, uh, someone who is not you, who you cannot be. Huh? And this figure, if you want, in a condensed way, is a dis we would say that Singji, uh, is, is a displacement of these desires in part of the uh, Bengal cultural imaginary. So this is one kind of layer. If you want the girl, uh, uh, on top of the road architecture, which I've just described to you, there's this other kind of thing. Who are these entities who are moving? What governs them in terms of instincts, motivations, emotions, etc.? How are they different from us? How we desire them, you know? So within this kind of uh, cultural set of exchanges, and we'll see, I've just mentioned several literary figures, figures of great significance in terms of the critique of uh, imperialism would nevertheless also be writing these adventure stories about these great Rajputs whom we have to recover. Not about Bengal, but about Rajputana as an important vector of what a renewed India would look like and what capacities it would have. Interestingly, Shomitro was already tired of the prospect of being this ex this figure of sensitivity and grace and comportment, someone who is part of modernity, that was going, he was going to incarnate for years ahead with Ray. Uh, he had already done it in, in Devi, which is a very important film. I'm not sure if it's in the series, uh, where he actually figures as someone who is defeated as an intellectual and a rationalist by traditional cultures which actually swamp his wife into a kind of sea of superstition. Uh, he's already kind of uh, done that. Now he wants to be something different. He said, I want to do this kind of figure. Chidanando and others are not very impressed with this performance. I leave it to you, what he's doing here. Uh, but this is uh, now him, uh, Ranveer Singh, this uh, out of control Rajput, this taxi driver. Uh, and this is on his dashboard. So you'll have on the left, an iconic image of the Rajput warrior on, uh, on top of a horse. There is passport size photograph for the license uh, is Ranveer Singh himself. So this would be on the dashboard of the taxi. And that is Ranveer Singh about to take off, about to take over, uh, overtake a car. And that's his kind of image. He looks as if he is a kind of, you know, uh, as the makeup is not great in my estimation. Uh, but nevertheless, you can see what he was trying to do and what he wanted to do differently. Here's a kind of quick thing, and you will come across all these figurations of Shomitro in the weeks ahead. Huh? With a, on the top left, 
Charulata is one of today's great films, huh? along with the great Madhubi Mukherjee. I must confess, I haven't identified the next one. Uh, after that is uh, Aranir Din Ratri, Days and Nights in a Forest. You'll see it later this, in this session. Going downwards, today's film, Abhijan, on the right, with the great Vahida Rahman, huh, whom I'll talk to you about a little bit. Dhritiman Chatterjee and Sumitro in Old Age, uh, in a version of Ibsen, An Enemy of the People, done late in Ray's career. Uh, Appur Shonshah, The World of Appu, which you will see in a short while, where the third of the trilogy, where uh, the grown Appu is retrieving his son after abandoning him. Onwards, 1973, about the uh, great and terrifying Bengal famine of 1943, called Distant Thunder. Upwards, uh, Gore Bhaire, the world, home and the world, one of the last films of Satyajit's career and an important novel by Bonkim Chandra Chatterjee. Uh, in the center, Shaka Prashaka, which is a, uh, where he is an uh, old and dying man who has to oversee the death of a liberal society uh, in the 1990s. Yeah. So this is a career straddling then from 1955 through to 1991. But these are the kind of diverse kind of uh, images we have of Shomitro. The one he wanted at this point was extreme right in the middle. <laughs> he wanted to be different. Huh? He wanted to be this Rajput, uh, you know, over emotional, out of control, uh, moved, moved by the instincts. If so, one, one, one layer, if you want, is that Gul uh, Bengal cultural imaginary, the Rajput, huh? and that type of figuration in relationship to the Bengali. Then there is the question of the e geological. And this, I think, is really about the ways in which nature are being kind of uh, explored, retrieved by the painters and artists of Shantiniketan, the place where, which I referred to, that is uh, Rabindranath's experiment with creating a kind of arts and crafts kind of uh, in initiative, which would also cultivate young people of whom Ray was one graduate. Huh? So that attraction was very much part of what pulled him in, if you want, to the project. And it is a, the adjacence of this kind of rock formations, which were part of the location of this film, which drew him into that space. So here is the rock formation. So out of the hurly-burly of those circuits, those kind of uh, ill-tempered encounters, etc., we come to this point where Ray and Joseph Ranjan Das, huh, the friend whom he has retrieved from childhood, the uh, untouchable turned uh, Christian, uh, go back into places of their childhood where they used to play, and there are these rock formations. This was one of the things which attracted Ray. Just looking at the time. Okay, um, and we see a series of these kind of, I've just got some images, but they're actually quite striking. Uh, there's this kind of unusual enthusiasm he feels when he encounters this space. It's not a characteristic demeanor on the part of Ranveer Singh. Uh, and he's remembering his youth and the inscription of childhood uh, of uh, names, etc., in this space, which they shared. And there's this reference back to the Rajput existence, that your father was a, uh, a great rider. Do you ride too? And the bit of wit. The, I don't have a horse, but I have horsepower, which actually kind of uh, <laughs> it powers my Chrysler. So there's a little bit of wit you know, in this dour entity who is otherwise not person given to, to humor. He actually kind of releases something in this encounter. And there's this remarkable, almost mystical moment where this gravity-defying rock uh, Ranveer comes close up to. So this is a shift away from the road, away from the kind of thickness of the contemporary, its politics, etc. You come into this space, and it's a space which ray, draws Ray into the making of the film. You want. Uh, okay. Okay, uh, very quickly we have uh, my suggestion is road movies, in this case, also the spaces of transformative encounters. And there are two levels of this. One is Singji and Neely. Uh, Joseph has a younger sister who is a, a very attractive woman who uh, teaches at school and actually teaches English. And he is, uh, when he comes and sees her and visits the house, he is completely uh, transported. He falls in love. And he also has a desire to learn English. He thinks this would be a vehicle of his self-improvement uh, in these times. So there are various reasons, but he's actually completely besotted, if you want, with her. Right? 
but unfortunately Neely's uh, affections are otherwise occupied uh, and later we will find that it is uh, Singji has to enable her elopement to meet this other lover. Uh, this is a moment of transformation and giving. It's as if he's, uh, he's losing his love, but he's giving her her fulfillment. And it is through the, the road and its expansion uh, uh, over space that she give, he gives it to her. This is the house. This is the place where they all gather together, the house of the former untouchable, now a Christian. There's Neely on the left, Joseph, and now Shomitra, that is uh, Ran uh, Ran Ran Ranveer coming in. A mother who is very self-conscious about the arrival of a Rajput in her in our house and worried that he may not be uh, willing to eat what is offered to him, which of course he keeps on he keeps on looking at Neely and he just gobbles the cake. I mean, it's like a, it's it's an act not of eroticism, but he's completely fixated, and there's no question that he's not going to eat what she's given him. Okay, uh, so, that, so th there's this configuration which is interesting. It goes in. The second transformative encounter is with the, the prostitute, the forced prostitute. She had been subject to uh, uh, abuse and uh, rape and abandonment and was taken up by this sexual trafficker who, and she kind of seeks his protection. He is rather rough. As you will see, he is not at all giving. He is distrustful of women. He suspects them of, their, uh, whether of the certainty of their affections. Uh, and so, but we see him in these spaces. There is sexual uh, relationship, and nevertheless, it is not converted at that moment into a romantic one. Uh, so there are these interesting kind of uh, complexities in the nature of the relationship. Okay, I just wanted to conf uh, at the end, all these things are configured as, as we will see, and uh, and there is a kind of takeoff point: the circuits, the jurisdictions, the constraints, and the control which are exercised over the road ultimately need to give way into some kind of utopian possibility. Uh, and I will leave you to look at what that might look like at the conclusion. I will also leave a, uh, just a reference, uh, because this will be an audience not necessarily familiar uh, with the setting, and I don't want to go too much into it. But in a sense, Ray comes into this film willy-nilly through various um, you know, contingent relationships, not necessarily by clear design, except to write the script. Huh? Uh, but once he comes in, he also opens up the space, if you want, of the film and the types of networks it draws upon. Not only does Sumitra, etc., undergo a revision in terms of how their personalities are articulated, but by drawing in the great Vahida Rahman into this film, he brings an extraordinary cultural kind of resonance into the space. Now, this is a figure, a great star already of Bombay cinema. Uh, she has actually been cultivated. She was a Muslim, and in fact, a, a Tamil and Telugu, and not firstly or Urdu-speaking Muslim, from the South. She is drawn into the cinema, not primarily as a performer in the first instance, but as a dramatic actor. And there's been some very interesting work on this relationship between dramatic performance and actually musical uh, dance performance as cultivated within the conventions of a career, but how these mutate in the context of the cinema. But she actually, uh, shortly after this, and Ray uh, is interested to have her. She is really wants to be part of a Ray project as well. There's this desire to be into a, a different space of art, cinema, etc. Within three years, after this, she makes one of the great road films, if you want, of Hindi cinema, but done uh, done on the basis of a bullock cart and its own rhythms of kind of the much slowed down rhythms of the bullock cart, as the great Raj Kapoor plays a bullock cart driver taking this Nautanki performer, who that is a performer of folk uh, dance, huh? but always bouldering, boundary, uh, the boundary of the illicit, you know, uh, uh, on a long trip to the place where she's to perform and their evolving relationship. The Tisri Kasam, The Third Promise, is one of the great films of Hindi cinema. So you can see this road net movie network may come and go and you need to implot it within a greater design. Well, I hope I have persuaded you to uh, see, see the film with interest, and I look forward to the discussion afterwards. OK, thank you. Yeah, we'll take a 10-minute break, uh, then start up the film, probably around 5 to 9. Uh, it is a film a little bit on the longer side, around two and a half hours. Uh, but we'll still have a little bit of time afterwards uh, for a discussion with Ravi. Uh, so enjoy the screening.
All right. Well, we have time for a few questions. We'll try to keep it a little quick because uh, it's already quite late. I believe Ritika also will be handling the roving mic, I guess, uh, in case of questions from the audience. Um, I might uh, start off with a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, there's some speculation in the in the room about uh, if Martin Scorsese hadn't seen the film, maybe Paul Schrader had. <laughs> um, but more to the point, then, I mean, how was this film received? Was it did it have screenings internationally? Was it received beyond India, or was it a much more kind of confidential knowledge? Surrounding the film outside of uh, outside of India, I, you know, I don't think anyone has done the research. But the claim is this is the most successful of Ray's films commercially in India. In India, yeah, yeah, because it. Uh, uh, but uh, where the level of its exhibition abroad, how, how much it circulated in international circuits, I, spe I suspect less. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not aware of it. But locally, in just in terms of co commercial theatrical run, uh, it was successful, and more so than most of his films. Uh, this is the received wisdom. I don't know. I don't think that anyone has done the research precisely on this. Do you have a hypothesis for the commercial success of the film compared to other Ray works? I would think melodrama. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think melodrama is one of the reasons as to why it would work. Because as, uh, you know, uh, following at least one of his mentors, uh, Renoir, Ray by and large went with the observation that uh, everyone has their reasons and no one is is evil. This would be one of his kind of general propositions, and I think he would follow the master in that. Whereas here we have a clear line of melodramatic kind of uh, co contrast, counterpoints, which may be one of the, uh, the reasons. I would, there would be specific attractions, no? I would think. For example, the figure of Vahida Rahman uh, might be another attraction, uh, as because she was a major star of Bombay uh, at this point. Uh, from 58 onwards, 57 onwards, 50, sorry, 55, 56 onwards, she had a sustained kind of career run. Uh, many hits, you know, many kind of, uh, and many landmark uh, hits, but that might be one of the attractions I would have thought. Uh, but certainly the kind of level of standard genre dimensions of, in terms of mel melodrama action, you, you know, uh, villainy and <laughs> restoration of good, etc. I think uh, would be one of the ra reasons which I could just hypothesize about. Yeah, although I mean, for a film that's commercially very uh, popular, it has a very unlikable protagonist. He's c an anti-hero of right. sorts. I mean, right. we don't warm to him particularly. No. No. Spectator might identify with him, but mm -hmm. it's not uh, it's not the archetypal heroic figure that you might expect for. Him popular cinema. No, I quite agree. I mean, I think that's what is the strength of the film at one level. That's why it works uh, for me as uh, intelli there's an uh, element of social and cultural and uh, intelligence which the film exhibits in terms of, you know, keeping to the character within a certain frame. Even the points where he kind of does something, it's not necessarily by great intentions or, you know, moral sensibility or any of those kind of, you know? It's almost by a sense of peculiar defaults, a set of defaults which emerges for him. And that becomes interesting, but you're right. I mean, the <laughs> villainy is clear, clear mm -hmm. but the good is not that clear, no? in terms of its uh, motivations. So that I agree, and that's what is interesting for me, but necessarily why would that work with a mainstream audience? Well, then we should give the mainstream audience a little <laughs> more intelligence perhaps as well. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, before throwing out to the audience, whether we're mainstream or not, uh, perhaps for just one last question from me. Uh, I wanted to maybe ask a little bit more about the uh, the jalopy, the yeah. trope of the jalopy in the film. Uh, it reminds me also of a Richard Gattach film from a few years yeah. earlier, whose title I'm going to mangle. Ajantric. Yeah, Ajantric. Yeah, Ajantric, yeah. Uh, where it's a very similar kind of... A, a, Beat up, old, dilapidated yeah. car from yeah. almost, I mean, almost seems centuries old, and but that, but that produces a kind of effective relationship between yes. the driver and the car, yes, uh, which we also see here, in a sense, the car becomes a kind of character in the film almost. Yeah, absolutely, um, and in fact, for a long time, the you know the question of the pathetic fallacy was a part of the kind of critical apparatus as to how to address these things. The fact that you are giving giving a kind of humanizing the uh, the kind of uh, the machine uh, and and what was it is facilitating something but it was not to be taken 
necessarily seriously in itself. Now, you would think that now the circumstances would be different because you would take it seriously in itself. Because it has a life, or it certainly has now be carries life investments and attachments within it. Uh, so that's the mo moment of the, the assistant, no? I mean, Rama. Rama actually is kind of completely shocked that you can actually kind of abandon the car because mm. the car is intimately related to you. You know, it has a personality, you have a, thing, a personality, and of course, we start, see the standard tropes where it refuses to start, even in, in this film, at key junctures. Uh, so I think with, with Ajahn Trik, uh, you have, it's an extraordinary film, uh, which, uh, and it, its compositional kind of finesse is remarkable in terms of the way it actually works with space, with, uh, with a senses of the forest, the sky. It's a, it's a remarkable piece of work. Quite different, I would think, from this in that dimension. And, uh, this, uh, and without melodrama per se. You know, it doesn't actually have that uh, affective structure. But it's interesting that these uh, films are almost cheek by jowl, and often uh, within the critical wisdom, uh, Jantrik is rated above this film. This that there is an interesting film. This is a commercial film. It gives too much away to you know kind of popular conventions, etc. Whereas both have are working within a spectrum of affect, which actually displaces a simple focus on the human, the, the series of things which can compose your world. You know, are critical to the way you can exist in the world. Huh? and the spaces through which you can navigate it. and So there's something really, uh, I, the, the, sh the film should be seen in parallel, in fact, uh, in, in counterpoints to each other. Yeah. Yep. Uh, questions from the audience, yes. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for your lecture. I have two points. Uh, number one is, this is also a film about film, right? Yes. I mean, there are many scenes where where our hero is looking at the mirror, or when they go to the movies. And uh, I very much like that yeah. because in a sense he functions like a machine too, like a car too. And the only human trait we see in the beginning is his narcissism. You know, he's yeah. always cutting his beard and, and, and um, he thinks he has to do like his past uh, 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 people have, have done. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, this is something that really surprised me and I liked very much. Um, I don't know if you can say something more about that. And the second point uh, would be, um, uh, what's wrong with melodrama? Uh, I, I always have the feeling that a lot of film scholars make fun about melodrama. And I don't really get this. Maybe you can explain that to me. Ravi is the person to explain melodrama because he wrote a book called The Melodramatic <laughs> Imagination. <laughs> Well, that was uh, someone else. But but, uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but still. Um, no, I think the first point is uh, fulsomely taken. And, you know, I think that's where this particular intersection between uh, uh, film and other visual technologies and cultures uh, becomes quite important in the Indian, uh, Indian and more generally in, uh, uh, so. It's a kind of intermediality of a particular sort. So when you say that it uh, is a film about film, uh, there is an element where it's a film about a certain type of imaging of the self. Now, that's to do also with mirror images and the extraordinary opening shot. I think that's an extraordinary opening shot where you're actually having a kind of the figuration of this as, as split, as fragmented, you know, the figure who is the protagonist and as completely inward because the uh, voice tonality is very important here. In fact, Moinak Bishas has written on similar scenes governed not by visual fracture but by actually sonic kind of... Uh, uh, a, lack, a, a lack of sonic kind of uh, attachment, you know? He's working with the, the figure of, you know, Xion and the Kuzma trees. But here, it's not a question of the voice. The voice can be heard, but the voice is somehow the visual, the visual and the fractured form actually pushes the voice in a different register, and you can hardly see the faces in and out of that fragment kind of thing. So, you know, you're, he's working, they're working with the image, you yeah? Insofar, and it is a powerful image within popular culture. That's the resonance of the dashboard um, uh, image, uh, uh, which is the, it's almost, you know, the, the photograph of the, of the license holder, plus the photograph of the iconic figure of the Rajput, you know? These are put cheek by jowl. And that becomes, and this is something which is more generally, 
been analyzed and engaged with in the context of Indian film studies as part of a wider fabric of visual culture? Uh, and what types of intermediality, what is the dynamic of this relationship between these forms? So it's cinema, but it's cinema refracted through a certain type of visual template or set of templates, which actually are kind of held, they're kind of, uh, you know, they're like fossilized. There may be deteriorated images, there may be all sorts of things which actually kind of form a kind of composite with cinema. The actual cinema scene is quite dis depleted, relatively so. You know, the one in the tent, the tent cinema, and with, uh, he quickly exits the scene to actually kind of move into a different frame. Melodrama, I'm fully on board with. I love it. I think it's a great and important and under-analyzed under, under, under field. Uh, and it's a question of how, what you do, um, how ambitious you become with it. There's a great ambition, I think, possible in the field. And there's more commonplace uh, you know, ways of actually kind of deploying melodramatic techniques. And there's been a lot of interesting argumentation about this. But I'm fine with this melodrama, especially when you suddenly and unexpectedly getting a, f a figuration of personality which is actually a little complex. This is a man who is actually caught within this vortex of self-images, what he should and should not do, what gives him honor and does not give him honor, who is his master, is he his own master, or suddenly, shockingly, he's told he's not his own master, he's equivalent to the courtesan, he's not different from the courtesan because they're both subject to the same entity, uh, which is a commodity form, actually, in that case, of a certain sort. So, you know, there's lots of this play with which uh, it can be housed in melodrama, but it actually is uh, <laughs> wonderful to see when it emerges in that fashion. Yeah. Uh, Vincent? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, the study of melodrama is, of course, one of the worst scenes of cinema studies. Uh, it's not, not like cinema studies doesn't care about it. Um, uh, the uh, I was sort of watching the film, constantly disagreeing with the criticism that it was not an interesting exploration of space, or that it lacked somehow mastery of space. I would say quite to the contrary, it's an extremely interesting uh, uh, exploration of space, and a lot of that has to do with with sound, with uh, you know those moments on the soundtrack where you have sustained sound patterns, music that refer to an elsewhere that is not um, uh, in the visual space, like the church bell, uh, the music in the background, people, you know, celebrating something, and it's an, an acoustic or a sonic elsewhere um, that is quite separate from the visual space, but that is actually significant and a repetition of the initial, of the poetics of the opening shot, if you will. Um, so I was just wondering if you could say something more about the sound. Well, the sound actually was very critical in that opening shot as well. You know, it is part of the design. Not necessarily in, in the dialogue, li dialogue space of what was happening between the two men, but as a kind of background. And that, uh, I think it has different functions at different points. Sometimes it is just this other way, which is just almost co-present. But sometimes when this church bell, and that I think is with the folk form, the folk uh, music which is actually deployed uh, periodically. But then the, actually the church bell actually acquires a different resonance, I think, you know? It is, uh, overlays things, it actually cry, acquires a symbolic function, I think, of a different order. There's some symbolic mapping which is taking place between those rocks, the sound of the church bell, and you know, the kind of, this one fracture of trust, it's a crucial fracture of trust. And I think one of the most moving things, the relationship between these two men and what actually drives this relationship. I think that's something which, if you're looking carefully, it is one of the most emotionally rich uh, uh, dimensions. Because in other cases, it is what my ide idealized image of you is, you know? For example, about his sister. You know, and this other figure is an amb ambiguous relationship with Wahida Rahman or Gulabi, you know? This, uh, but this is something which is free, it would seem, in some crucial fashion, of any of these, ca of these calculus, you know, of, of the things. And there, the, actually, the way the uh, geological formation, the, the bells, the, this kind of riven kind of friendship all come together in some interesting fashion uh, is suggestive. The Ray's great wit comes through music as well. The jalopy <laughs> and the particular way, the kind of uh, musical form through which it actually is articulated, you know, in terms of the movement of characters in the space of the car, 
the way the actual kind of the beats which are actually kind of used to kind of make it a kind of uh, a place of you know it's a pleasurable engagement with a particular form which is predicated on the musical form as much as on what you're seeing visually and what types of rhythms are being built. The, the movement of the characters in the core in you know in sync with the music uh, in in the title sequence, which is you know played for comical effect. Wonderful. Re it reminded me of of the opening shot of uh, Goodbye South, Goodbye by Ho Xiao Shen, which has a similar comic effect. So there there starts of this techno music on the on the soundtrack, and then suddenly you see you know the main characters, the gangster sitting in a train and being shaken by the train in in sync with with uh, with the soundtrack. But it's it's just very beautifully done. Uh, yeah, Michael. I have a question regarding the, the soundtrack. Um, if I'm not wrong, the dialogues were in Hindi, but the titles were in Bengali. Um, was there a Bengali version of the movie? And does it make sense which one would be the original? So this is a kind of, it's hybrid. Huh? There's a lot of hybridity going on. It's to do with the territory, this kind of junction where people are moving uh, you know, uh, in between spaces and a certain type of, Hindi Bengali mix, or sometimes just quite uh, straightforward Hindi, is actually deployed. But it's not as if it's you know separated out in terms of the actual versions or anything like that. So both would be combined. When we first see, uh, for example, if, and we are seeing moving uh, another thing, a register of dialect within Hindi, which is not necessarily easily intelligible. So Vahida Rahman will be actually uh, using both that a dialect. Then she keeps on asking him, "Do you understand what I'm saying?" You know, uh, for this word. Uh, and she's, so she's moving between uh, these forms. Sometimes it's Bengali, sometimes it's a Hindi dialect. Huh? Uh, it's not Hindi-Hindi in the Bo Bombay Hindi kind of style either. You know? So this is part of the matrix. Is often people have said this is the matrix of the bazaar. You know, to actually the intelligibility of exchange predicated on the actual exchange of goods of all sorts and the meeting of people of all sorts of backgrounds to facilitate an, a, a transaction requires a certain type of linguistic kind of hybridity and a mix of, of, of forms. So this actually inhabits that kind of uh, domain. And that's the space, I think, inhabits it. I thought also, uh, coming back to the question of space, it is actually, uh, when you look, at, he actually spends a lot of time. One is the sonic, but the other thing is the actual way, in uh, the depth of space, the actual kind of natural landscape. This particularly moving uh, things where the car is being actually kind of filled with water, it's actually just there next to the kind of bank. You know? We've seen this in Ajantrik also. You will see things like that in the, uh, the Ritwik Ghatak uh, film. But there's this melding between nature, and layers of nature. And it's within this scape, you can have all these kinds of things. But there is this overarching form within which that train is being kind of uh, chased by, by, the, uh, by, the, uh, by the taxi driver. You remember that moment of hubris? It is a Rajput hubris. He will overtake not only a car, he will overtake a train. But in this, there's the depth and the density of this landscape. Um, can I ask also about the, uh, the close-ups in the film, uh, particularly these moments where it's kind of, he wants to overtake the vehicle. Um, and I think by the, the end of the film, it's made clear to us, this is the kind of the warrior, the ancient warrior instinct yes. kind of reactivating in him. <laughs> but I found the close-up so extraordinary because they somehow, for me, evoked a kind of silent cinema aesthetic where the close-up is actually much more divorced really from the spatial world of the rest of the film. Uh, it's almost like we're kind of being transferred to a different universe, which is like his interior world in a sense. I don't know. Uh, it didn't. It felt to me like a... A very unique use of uh, uh, of close-ups, or distinctive, let's say, from... That's very interesting. I mean, I think one of the things is to do with this particular form of interiority, which is being mapped through this face. There's something to be done about what work Sumitra is being asked to, to do with his face. Uh, and it's it, at first, that, that I still can't get over the beard. <laughs> still, I'm not persuaded by the beard. But was, it, was, was, it a, was it a real beard? His real beard? Or was I it know, a, could be. a paste it's on? Because he's otherwise grown beards for other films, so it's quite possible it might be. Yeah? But he's certainly done color work. Some kind of color work has been done on it. Uh, but this particular thing where it's actually, 
it's a suppressed kind of thing. It's like it's an interiority which is not giving ex mm. expression to itself. And there's something which is, so that's one dimension. The other thing I think is the studio shots. It's as simple as that. We got this kind of dynamic of the chase of the kind of of cars in movement and all that, and but you've got back projection and you've got time to actually work on that kind of image uh, uh, in the in the stillness and in the artifice of the studio. No, that's the co uh, counterpoint which would work. I think that you felt sometimes, oh, here he is. They put him and now they ask him to express or emote in a particular fashion. You know, when he makes that decisive move. I will chase and overtake. <laughs> There's a particular kind of iconic moment. So I think it works two ways. It's a form, t issue of performance, and it relates to the to this species of actually, uh, uh, c you know, contained or suppressed subjectivity. It's always unclear as to what how to locate itself. And the other thing is, I think, how the shots are manufactured. I think there's something to be said in that as well. The silent cinema didn't strike me, I'm afraid, with that, that particular with that, but I might think about it. Okay. Further questions from the room? I can ask a quick question, maybe. Ravi, do you know how much the film deviates from the novel? Like, is there any kind of evidence I'm on that? I, I don't know, except in one crucial instance. It's very important because Tara Shankar is an extremely important and dense novelist. Um, but the one crucial instance is the wife dies. She does not leave him. Hmm? So it's not a, it's a, it is a loss of a sort which is not that of betrayal. It is not the betrayal of trust. It's not, and, and the implication is that because he could not put together a business, he was actually kind of, you know, there's a monopoly which has actually surfaced in the, in the town. Uh, he therefore could not make his way, you know, enough custom, whatever it is, so that she was not happy. That was the implication. Um, so there, that's a bit of melodrama of the woman, the woman betra me, woman's betrayal, mm -hmm. which he's con constantly having to deal with when he deals with others. There's also the question of adaptation, like how yeah. to, uh, especially with the Vaida Rahman character, and I was really wondering like how much of an interiority does her character have in the novel, because the film kind of, by just sheer framing kind of techniques, it does a lot with that, you know, when he's speaking, but we see her, or when she's speaking, but he's, she's kind of in the foreground and he's in the background. I think uh, um, the uh, next set of Ray speakers, we should ask some of these Bengali specialists yes. uh, who is with uh, literary uh, knowledge to actually just give us a few little uh, orientation, or a note even. You don't have to do anything more than that. But Mon uh, Moenak or someone would be able to do that for us. Just briefly, there is a short reference to Freud in the film, that is the dirt is business oh. kind of stuff. Right. And I was wondering, can you tell us something about uh, Ray's knowledge of psychoanalysis, Lacan, whatever? Do you know anything about it, or? I can't say I know very much about the, the question. I don't know if uh, you've come across anything uh, specifically. I mean, psychology is obviously important to him, but psychiatry or psychoanalysis, these are two things. He's a great. He's a great. He's a nuanced uh, director of psychology. No, isn't he? He's very good in trying to uh, in key uh, ways. But uh, the actual theoretical engagement, or the his knowledge base there, again, something to be take on board and look. You know, you cannot but be a, think that he'd have some engagement with it. He's a well-read. You know, hugely. He's a chap who uh, knows a lot. You know, he traveled much. He read a lot. He's. Well, best his interactions were formidable with a lot of people, so I would, he would be in the sphere of thinking about whether it actually defined his attitude or approach. I don't know. But points to be taken up: the adaptation, uh, psycho psychoanalysis. One can kind of see it like drives p propelling, oh, yes. seeing forward at, at moments in the film. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is the id on <laughs> <laughs> on high, on high drive. <laughs> uh, yeah, Stephen. But also a lot of ego, mm -hmm. <laughs> it would seem yes, to me. That's and, true. Uh, that's it's very interesting to, yeah. the, that you mentioned the change from the novel, since so much of the movie, and I'm not sure it's melodrama, but drama, is about the questions of loyalty. Mm -hmm. And this be his feeling betrayed seems to be a major motivation for his mistrust and so on. And what's melodramatic maybe more about it is then his misrecognition of himself. 
and that he's betraying himself in this whole long process and even his car in the end. Um, whereas the other characters, particularly the female ones, seem to have a lot more sense of self or of being in a way true to themselves what he doesn't see. Uh, I think that's very well put. I mean, this figure is, you know, requires much more attention in terms of exactly what set of things determine his attitude, his self-perception, his perception of others, and uh, trust. Because by the end of it, he himself realizes he is breaking trust, you know, in a crucial way. Hitherto, he has not, he has always uh, 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 applied that to others. Others are responsible for this. But now there's a, a, a series of, of uh, act, actions which he has undertaken, with, uh, including with his car, his helper, uh, with Gulabi, uh, but his friend, his dear friend Joseph, you know. And uh, interestingly, that trust is not necessarily predicated on his having uh, liberated his sister, I don't think. I mean, it depends on how one looks at it, but it's not necessarily that which uh, causes an anxiety, a zone of anxiety. I think it is simply that he has actually abandoned Joseph, you know. That if we come down to it, this is my I was saying, is this because he's, he feels that he's betrayed him because his sister, he's, he's done something, taken away his sister? But I'm not sure that that's the thing. The trust of the two men, the in, inherent, there's a love. I don't know. It's a, it is a form of, I think, uh, there, there is a love relationship of sorts which is uh, evolving here, which I found particularly interesting. I mean, oh. it's curious there because the way that their encounter is set up, he f it feels like he wants to get rid of this guy or he's mm. like, why are you bothering me? Mm. Um, there's a real wall that he's kind of at, at the put up. Uh, no, the I'm talking about the start when they first encounter, oh. when they first meet each other, there's, there's, this, oh, right. there's a sense that yeah. he doesn't want anything to do. Yeah, this yeah. guy's That's pestering true. him, he yeah, yeah. get away from him. Yeah. Uh, he has a very strong wall to kind of uh, but that, that, that is a wall potential human interactions, I'd say, and, and Joseph is really kind of yeah. con concertedly battering that wall yes, down. That's right. So I think that's true. That is the wall set up by Rana Pratap, isn't it? I mean, against the world. And it's a misanthropic thing, it's become. And now how will that be kind of breached? Through what set of interactions would it be breached? And here that climax I thought was very interesting, just in terms of the way the uh, interplay between the two men works out and what exactly was being it, uh, what was the ambition of this because it was effective for I thought it was really effective because you caught something which was critical uh, everything else in a sense was facilitated um, in what you know with what conviction or awareness he undertook those acts that's part of Rana Pratap's uh, uh, personality the opaqueness of this personality but one thing the guilt which shone through at the climax uh, was, you know, it's kind of irreducible. There was something very special and specific, I thought, happening there. Uh, okay, one last question, Mario. Uh, I find uh, it's very interesting that you situate the climate uh, between the two men because for me the climate with, uh, was between uh, the woman and um, the man uh, because I see this story also as a conflict of, of interest. It's uh, in the both sense of the word interest. It's uh, what is profitable for him but also um, aesthetically what is in the focus of the film, what is the interest of the film. And in this scene, uh, it's very uh, obvious uh, also with the work, with the sound, that we can hear her story for the first time, but she's struggling with the uh, attention because he's, he's not interested in the story at first. And then this whole work with the camera, the shift of intention in this uh, scene, for me, for me it was that, um, a very strong scene, and it's uh, the shift from his personal interest in the interest of other also. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was a climax of the film and the whole um, development of the film in this scene. So that's interesting, because I think that's a question of, uh, I, I, w w I thought it's a fascinating scene, because it's actually, again, there's a fulsome description of the act what, what uh, Vahida uh, Gulabi has been through, and to bring her to this situation. But the interesting part was how 
much and with what intensity and with what level of responsiveness he is listening to that you know so it's that mi- the continuing mismatch which actually is suggestive about him uh, especially and i think the one key thing when you're talking about interest is this equivalence it actually hits him hard that he is equivalent to her he is actually not different or superior to her but and he thinks he's actually transiting into this different zone no by acquiring this partnership and which is bringing him into equivalence with the merchant and the lawyer and whatever you know so he's actually transcended that and yet she she says it is exactly that which is causing your submission and making you no different from me what claim can you have on me now that you do not offer me a space outside this you know Uh, the assumption always is that he will offer a space beyond this uh, uh this submission this uh, 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 the f- the frame of sub- uh, submission to this bani the marwadi and the no uh, isn't it that's a trigger of sorts and he is actually cannot understand these refusals which are taking place uh by his helper also by her you won't come i mean there's a disbelief why should things change in what because he and then he once he sees to the, the her being having been abducted or taken away etc it's that point which triggers a shift where he has to assume this superior position he has to be the rajput he has to gallop you know but it's also not necessary that is an image at the end of the day it is an image which motivates or pushes but the source of the anxiety comes from this zone of equivalence where he has actually fallen down he is no different from others and that i found particularly interesting how it's set up mismatch and then equivalence you know he is not listening to her and then he listens to her but not because she's told him this story but because he is no different from her right well uh we could talk all night but <laughs> but maybe we should leave it there uh thanks once again to ravi vasudevan uh for the excellent uh presentation and uh stimulating discussion afterwards so thank you very much ravi <laughs> and i think we'll be back in 3 weeks time on the 23rd of the 11th fritika tell us who and what <laughs> <laughs> No, it's also f- um, escaped your mind, Vincent. Do we? Vishnu Priya Ghosh and the yes. film. <laughs> oh yeah, um, Prati Dwandi. Okay, um, great. Yeah. Uh, see Please everyone there uh, on the twenty third. Well, see everyone here on the twenty third. <laughs>